welcome to the 24th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018. I can remind everyone to turn their mobile devices to silent as they may interfere with the broadcasting. We have received apologies this morning from Les Smith, uh, and I welcome to the committee uh, Alison Harris, who's attending as a substitute. And as it's her first meeting, I would like to take the opportunity to ask Alison Harris if she has any declaration of interest. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item two today is a decision on taking business in private and um, I would ask the committee whether to take agenda item six in private and whether the consideration of the report on young people's pathways inquiry in private at future meetings and whether to take consideration of the work programme at the next meeting in private to members content with us. Thank you very much. Um, I now move to agenda item three. Uh, which is the fourth evidence session in the inquiry into young people's pathways. And uh, warmly welcome to the meeting this morning, uh, Jamie Hepburn, MSP, Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills. Also Hugh McAloon, Deputy Director and Head of Fair Work and Skills. Jonathan Gray, Head of CLD Policy and Post 16 Programmes. And Murray McIver, Unit Head, Learning Directorate of the Scottish Government and um, I would invite the uh, Minister to make some opening remarks and maybe say just in general terms how the developing the young workforce is progressing. Thank you, Vera. I didn't intend to make a, a, too much of a substantive uh, set of opening remarks other than to say I very much welcome uh, the focus that the committee uh, has uh, on the uh, particular inquiry that you're taking forward in terms of young people's pathways, the great interest that you've taken in developing the young workforce. Uh, I think... Um, Across the board, there's great support for that as a direction of travel. In terms of the progress this is uh, making, uh, undoubtedly we'll get into some of the detail there. My own estimation is when I go out and about and uh, go into the school environment, work with uh, the 21 regional groups that we have, uh, significant progress has been made, but clearly much more is uh, to be done. Uh, undoubtedly we'll get into that in a few months' time. So that's all I have to say just now, Kavira, other than, of course, I should say... Uh, Congratulations to you on your, your new role. It's my first time at the committee since uh, you took this esteemed office. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I'll move to opening questions. I think Mr MacDonald's going to come in first. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Minister. Uh, we're halfway through, we're at the halfway point in a seven-year DYW programme that is, aims to transform the relationship between schools, employers and colleges and the preparedness for young people for the world of work. Um, are you satisfied with the pace of change that's been achieved so far? If you look at the, certainly the headline target that we had to reduce the level of uh, youth unemployment uh, by 40% by 2021 from 2014 uh, levels, having achieved that uh, early, then uh, of course I'm satisfied uh, with that. In terms of the uh, the the fact that we now have 21 regional groups covering the length and breadth of Scotland, beginning some uh, innovative work, quite different region uh, by region, which is the approach that we wanted to see uh, taken, because of course each area has its own uh, local requirements, its own local uh, economic uh, needs, um, different demographics. Having those 21 groups now embedded, all employer-led, um, beginning uh, to create new relationships between our reaffirming existing relationships between employers and the school environment, uh, that is uh, good uh, progress. If we see the, uh, the increase uh, in terms of the number of young people uh, attaining um, uh, vocational uh, qualifications um, uh, up by 17% uh, in August 2016 compared to August 2015, then that has to be uh, welcome. Uh, undoubtedly, the one, as I alluded to, uh, uh, in my opening remarks, um, in response to the request from the convener, uh, there is more uh, to be done. Um, we uh, are uh, we've, clearly this is a seven-year um, uh, strategy, but the uh, the culture change that we want to see embedded has to uh, go further than the seven-year period. It has to be embedded longer term. That's not going to happen overnight. But uh, yes, I'm, I believe we made uh, a good progress already in this this early phase. In, in terms of the 21 regional employer groups that you mentioned, I mean, there's obviously challenges in trying to hit some of the relevant KPIs, like employing young people direct from school, 
employment rate for young disabled people and positive destinations for looked after young people. I mean, how important are these employer groups and uh, how uh, are you attracting uh, the right quality and number of employers, given that the vast majority of employers in Scotland are SMEs? Yeah, I mean, that's, there is always going to be a challenge. We find that as a, a challenge uh, across the range of activity that uh, we have uh, in place in terms of uh, apprenticeships, for example, we often hear it can be a challenge in engaging small and medium enterprises. It's essential uh, we do so in terms of the developing young workforce agenda. It's going to be particularly the case in some uh, geographies where uh, small and medium enterprises make up an, an even bigger uh, share of the, the profile of uh, companies area by area. Uh, we're entrusting our regional groups to take forward that activity. They are the people who are best placed to do that. Indeed, some of the people who are uh, tasked and charged with Heading up those groups uh, are themselves uh, involved in working with small and medium uh, enterprises. Uh, so they are the ones that have the best knowledge on the ground in terms of their own uh, local area uh, to make the appropriate connections and we are entrusting them to, to get on with that. Now, again, it go back to the point that I made. Um, there is progress in that regard. I see that happening on the ground, uh, but there is still more to be done. Uh, in terms of the... the, the uh, uh, the points you made about uh, the, the qualities uh, agenda. I and mean, we have been moving in the, the right uh, direction. I uh, know that, um, for example, uh, in the uh, last uh, period, uh, we have seen uh, an increase since the baseline figures were recorded in 2012-13 of 6.7 percentage points in the uh, positive destinations of looked after uh, young people. Uh, in terms of the employment rate for young disabled people it is, uh, and in line with disabled people of all ages, um, shockingly low, unacceptably low. And of course, we have convener set out our ambitions to do much more in terms of tackling the disability employment gap. But as moving in uh, the right direction, there was uh, an increase of eight percentage points compared to the, the baseline figure of 35.2% uh, back in 2014. So. Um, we're moving in the right direction. <coughs> uh, there is positive progress, but again, much more to do. Uh, my final point is about um, that there are now different pathways that uh, young people can take. Um, and one of the, the table of information we were provided with shows that there has been progress in uh, encouraging people to look at the options for college or training programmes. Uh, Etc. And I'm just wondering, how do you reach out to parents who have got a huge amount of influence on the um, options that young people have uh, when they come to decide what they're going to do after school? Uh, well, this is the, the, the thorny topic of, I mean, fundamentally, it's the parity of esteem issue. So we have no problem. And in the main, obviously, there are still significant issues in terms of the attainment the gap, poverty-related attainment gap, although, again, um, that is closing. We see uh, those um, from the uh, lower uh, income deciles uh, attaining um, uh, growth and attainment at a faster rate than those in the upper income uh, deciles. But in the main, there's no uh, problem in terms of uh, parents uh, recognising and understanding the value of young people going on to tertiary education, higher education in uh, particular. There is still a, a challenge for us in terms of um, broadening horizons and getting them to understand that there is just as much value uh, in uh, young people pursuing vocational pathways. I see that often enough in terms of when I go out to speak to modern apprentices and the great value they've taken from the work-based learning they're engaged in. Indeed, many of them will say, many of them actually, their intention was to go to higher education and they've preferred this avenue because they're, they're starting to get a wage uh, more immediately than they would if they went to, uh, to university. But yes, there is a significant uh, piece of work to be done. Uh, Skills Development Scotland is actively engaged uh, across a range of activity to uh, try and um, uh, ensure that parents are better informed of the options that uh, their children uh, can have uh, in the school environment and uh, just as critically, perhaps more critically, uh, post uh, school. Um, I, I met with, uh, uh, along with the Deputy First Minister, with the, uh, the uh, Chair 
and the, uh, the Chief Executive of Skills Development Scotland um, a few months ago, and we were discussing this very issue. Skills Development Scotland are now actively uh, going out and participating in parents' uh, evenings in a way that they didn't before. There is still an issue of um, trying to get parents to engage, even uh, when that uh, happens. But there is other work underway as well. For example, um, Skills Development Scotland are in the process of developing a dedicated site for parents to support, better support their understanding of careers information uh, and uh, guidance. Uh, and there is uh, also, there has been a, uh, just uh, earlier this year, in August, uh, there was uh, the National Action Plan uh, on parental involvement, engagement, family learning and learning at home. It was uh, it launched earlier this year. It's a three-year plan that's been pulled together between the government and COSLA uh, with uh, input from the National Parent Forum to try and uh, work to this end of ensuring uh, that parents are better informed about the, uh, the choices that their children can have. Thank you so much. Mandel. Thank you. Convener, I was hoping to ask the Minister about uh, equality of, of opportunity across the country because one of the key concerns for me certainly representing a rural area is that the challenges around DYW are different uh, in different uh, regions and that to some degree no matter how hard uh, some of the rural DYW groups work that there, there, there is a limited pool of employers and that restricts opportunities ultimately for some, some young people. What's the Scottish Government doing to ensure that young people, no matter where they live in Scotland, have access to the same opportunities? Uh, well, we're taking a range of different measures uh, in different ways. So, for example, for modern apprentices, we uh, introduced the rural supplement uh, for training providers uh, last year. Uh, that was the first time it had uh, been put uh, in place in recognition of the challenges that training providers and people engaged in the modern apprenticeship will face, the additional barriers they may face, the additional hurdles they face in rural uh, communities. So that's an enhanced payment for providers in recognition of the additional uh, cost. That was a success. In fact, we've, we've broadened the scope. So uh, last year, uh, the qualification was uh, uh, determined by local authorities. The local authorities we recognised as being most rural. We've actually expanded that so that it now falls down by definition by postcode. So if uh, it's a remote rural area, defined as a remote rural area or a remote town, uh, then uh, and the training providers based there, then they can uh, qualify for uh, that, uh, that enhanced uh, payment. So far more training providers, far more people engaged in a modern apprenticeship are benefiting by that. Of course, colleges through Scottish Funding Council have um, a, a formula that uh, allocates extra uh, funding based on rurality uh, as well. Uh, but again, we're, we're entrusting our developing young workforce uh, regional groups. Um, I'm sure uh, Mr Mundell has engaged actively with the, uh, the developing young workforce regional group in Dumfries and Galloway. I have been hugely impressed by uh, that uh, regional group. I mean, all of our regional groups are doing great work, but the work that has been done in Dumfries and Galloway is uh, very innovative. They had uh, uh, um, a fantastic jobs fair uh, that was uh, held in uh, Mr Mundell's uh, constituency at the Crichton campus with um, children invited from across the entire local authority area. They supported them uh, to come to engage with uh, the uh, array of employers that exist uh, across uh, the area of all uh, sizes. Uh, and they're also doing innovative stuff such as trying to ensure uh, that they have sectoral groups feeding in to their uh, board so that each uh, sector within the area uh, can have their interests properly represented. So, uh, you know, again, that's that's very much led from a grassroots level and recognition that the people that we've entrusted with taking forward the developing young workforce agenda on the ground uh, understand what's uh, best available in the area, the challenges that exist in the area, area and there's more we can do, then they can uh, feed that back to us and we can consider it. I thank the Minister for that, that answer. I mean, I was at the jobs fair in question, and I know uh, he was as well, uh, but we missed each other uh, very conveniently. Uh, I was uh, leave, leaving just as you were walking, just as you were walking in the door. Uh, however, uh, you know, a number of schools weren't able to be present at that event uh, because of transport costs. 
Um, and by the time the DYW group was in the position to offer transport to those schools, it was too late for some of the schools. They felt that the distance to travel to Dumfries and the amount of time it would take out of their day you know, and, and the level of staffing they had within their schools made that uh, difficult for, for all young people in the region to attend. You know, so I'm, I'm really asking, you know, I, I, I understand the positive measures that have been taken across the board, but are the DYW groups in rural communities getting the same uh, acknowledgement in their funding uh, of the difficulties of delivering uh, some of these measures uh, in, in, in rural communities? Is, is that taken into consideration? Essentially, the way any group was established is they come forward uh, together. So it's not a top-down model at all. Uh, it would be determined by a group of people come together. Uh, clearly, uh, we uh, have, actually through Rob Woodward, who is the person, former chief executive of STV, who we have uh, asked to um, head up our efforts at a, a national uh, level in terms of employer engagement, engagement with the uh, groups. He was um, essentially reaching out to people to particularly in areas where it was proving difficult to get groups established. And we had that conversation with Mr Scott, and I'm very pleased to see we've got a very good and active group in his constituency. Uh, and now, but the way it works is that um, those people would come together and they would bring forward a proposition to the national group. And if they thought it was a good proposition, that would take account of the costs that they would forecast that would be involved in taking forward their activity. They would then come to myself to sign off on any proposition they think is a good one. So again, that comes down to the, the group to take forward what they uh, think uh, they require. <clears throat> that said, uh, of course, this is a, a, an experience of being informed by uh, what happens on a practical basis. So if uh, a particular group uh, finds that there is an impediment to a certain form of activity, uh, then we will consider it. So going back to uh, Mr Scott's uh, constituency had a very useful meeting with the chair one of the and again to show how different each group can be they've got three co-chairs in Shetland I met with one of the uh, co-chairs there who was raising the issue of additional costs from getting from an island community to for chairs to participate in roundtable meetings with other chairs I've undertaken to take that way and consider it so if the issues are raised Mr Mundell then we will uh, consider them I suppose the other point, not that I want to be top down and uh, instructive on these matters, my expectation is that um, the Priest and Galloway's efforts, despite it being your constituency, Mr. Mundell, wouldn't be uh, entirely located in the Priest. And indeed, I know they're, they're undertaking activity across the entirety of the, the local authority area. Uh, thank you uh, for that. The final uh, question I wanted to ask was whether or not you felt that the balance was right between the needs of employers and the needs of young people, uh, because that's another concern uh, that's come up uh, locally, uh, where some parents um, and certainly some teachers feel uh, that uh, the interests of uh, employers, although uh, it's very positive they, they're taking part in the DYW group, uh, are, are doing a great job at, at building that engagement, but that some uh, employers locally who struggle to find uh, young people uh, willing to work, willing to stay in the region and work, uh, that the, the, the process ends up uh, motivating uh, bright young people who uh, have the potential and have ideas to, to do other things, uh, to, to stay locally exactly for the reason you were talking about before, where they see an incentive uh, to earn money quickly, uh, rather than uh, considering all the, the career options that are maybe available to them. Do you think, do you think well, we've got that balance right? I think that's the fundamental point. So um, it's about trying to make sure that they are as informed as possible about the opportunity that exists on their doorstep. Now, it's always going to be the case that some young people will choose for whatever reason to... And it doesn't just happen. I know it's a particularly acute issue in rural communities. I wouldn't uh, shy away from that at all. But it also happens in urban communities. Young people may choose to move elsewhere for a variety of reasons because um, that's just what they want to do. Um, we're never going to be able to, to mitigate it against that entirely. What we can do, though, is try and deal with the issue where young people feel they have no option other than to move away, where actually there might be options available to them. And this is a process of ensuring that employers can engage with the school environment in an appropriate fashion, not only to help better shape the curriculum uh, so that young people can make uh, decisions about the subjects they may want to study to get them into particular career pathways, but also sometimes just as simple as making young people aware 
that they are an employer, employer on their doorstep. I've been quite uh, surprised to uh, go to communities where there's been an employer that's well established for a long time, could be employing quite a substantial number of people, and the young person will invariably they'll probably be aware that they're there, but they just won't have any idea of what they do. And if they don't have any idea what they do, how can they know whether it's or not it's something that they want to engage in? So again, that, that speaks of the need to have that type of engagement. In terms of the balance of um, uh, interest, I don't see any uh, conflict between the interests of um, the employers engaging in this and the interests of, of young people. Uh, indeed, it's a, a virtuous uh, cycle. Uh, you know, it's, it's an employer's enlightened self-interest, is the way I would describe it, to be engaged in this agenda. It's about them being able to give something back to young people in their community to help them with their education, but also if they, th and through offering work uh, experience opportunities, for example, they identify a young person who is adept at and skilled and keen and interested in working in their particular uh, company or business, they might then end up offering them a job opportunity. So I, I don't see any inherent tension between the, the interest. I think so we're just making sure that balance is, is correct. And I think broadly we've, we've got that right. Thank you. Scott, you wanted in? Yeah. Ask just a couple of supplementaries. And firstly, I apologise to Mr Hepburn for not being in Shetland when he was there. It was, it was Anfield with my son or Mr Hepburn, and you'll understand uh, the, the pressures that occasionally fathers have come under to take one son to Anfield. Of course they won. It's Liverpool. It was worth it. Yeah. Indeed. Um, but I do apologise for not being present. Um, just related to Oliver Mundell's questions, two, que two supplementaries on... On, um, on that line of, uh, of thought, uh, Minister. The first is on, well, both on work experience, because the, uh, I'm sure when you were in Shetland, it may have been reflected to you that while um, young people are entitled to one week's work experience in a senior phase, a lot of parental um, suggestion, nay pressure, is for earlier work experience in the earlier stages of secondary school to provide some of the, um, to help young people in the way in which you've just been describing. And I wonder if you've given any thought, or the government's given any thought to how best to uh, encourage um, more and earlier work experience opportunities for young people in the uh, earlier phases of secondary school. Um, I mean, that, I think, again, that's got to be it determines, again, we can't be top down and tell each school what they've got to do. Uh, if a young person identifies an opportunity and a head teacher in the, uh, his or her school environment feels that's something they can support, then I would absolutely encourage that to, uh, to happen. Um, if you're talking about on a systemic basis, clearly we seek to be informed by what we're, we're uh, putting in place here. Um, I think it is appropriate that we have focus the work experience element, uh, particularly because we want it to be meaningful work experience, particularly if we're talking about the role of foundation apprenticeships, uh, then I think it's appropriate to have that largely focused at the, the senior phase um, uh, of uh, secondary school. Uh, but that's not to say that if um, there are opportunities for earlier uh, work experience that shouldn't be explored, that shouldn't be supported. Also, uh, beyond just the provision of work experience, we should be ensuring that um, even in advance of uh, secondary school, actually, within the primary school environment, for example, that uh, they are engaged in making young people uh, better aware of the uh, world of, of uh, work, the opportunities that uh, exist uh, for uh, them to be actively and engaged in thinking about the, how their learning can uh, sit better with uh, the uh, world of work. There is, through uh, developing the young workforce, a range of activity taking place um, early in uh, the school experience, um, which um, you know have some uh, specific and localised examples uh, in, um, uh, uh, in, in Fife, Dalgetty Bay Primary is engaged um, in thinking about career and education as an integral part of uh, their school improvement uh, planning. Busby Primary in East Renfrewshire has developed a skills uh, academy. Uh, Bond Hill Primary in Western Bartonshire is engaged in uh, thinking about enterprise and entrepreneurship. There are, are other uh, examples as well of, of employee engagement at that stage. Um, but there's obviously got to be a balance struck between that type of activity and uh, what I think we would 
to have a different um, experience as being work experience. To take all that, and it's entirely fair, the point I was seeking to drive at was uh, young people who are probably going to leave at S4 or who do leave at S4 and what they have had to assist them in the choices they make in the early... So I, I take all you say about the senior phase and what you say about the primary school, that's fine. But my, the specific point is about those S4 leavers. Can we do more for those young people at an earlier stage in, in school? And I take your point about top-down. It's for the young, it's for the local delivery groups to, to do some work on. But do you have a view on that? Yeah. Yes, no, I would agree. I think we can. Uh, and I think that's a fundamental part of the ethos of developing young workforce in terms of... Uh, the direction of travel, taking careers information and guidance. Also, in recognition of uh, the point that Mr Scott has made, um, we're now starting to look at how we deliver foundation apprenticeships, for example. So when we first introduced them, they were very rigidly a two-year approach. Um, we're now starting to explore whether or not actually we should maybe be a bit more flexible. Um, and. And for that very reason, because if a, a young person starts in S4 and decides to leave at the end of at fourth year, then they're not going to have completed that and got a qualification. I'd much rather that they might be able to, to do a year's form of work experience, get some form of qualification, and if they decide to stay on, they can uh, continue to proceed to get a further qualification in fifth year. If they uh, don't, then at least they've got some form of qualification as they enter the world of work. And again, uh, with that particular model, it could be that the employer says, this person's good, let's give them a modern apprenticeship. Indeed, I think the success of the Foundation Apprenticeship Programme we uh, put in place it will not solely be judged on this, because we also want universities to um, recognise it as a qualification for uh, entrance to university, but ultimately it can be judged by its success in the number of young people engaged in a foundation apprenticeship who move on to a modern apprenticeship. Now, we're probably not quite there yet, but that's where I want to stand up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fee? Thank you. Good morning, Minister. It's just a follow-up question on foundation apprenticeships. Can you give us a bit of detail about how the targets for foundation apprenticeships were reached? Um, I, I think they have been reached on the basis of recognising that we couldn't just go in overnight and say that thousands of these are going to be delivered. So it's been a process of, of growth. Now, if you look at the, uh, the overall trajectory of um, foundation apprenticeships over the last uh, few years, we have seen uh, that uh, growth. So uh, last year, there were some uh, 1,200 or so uh, provided the year uh, before that, 1,245 in uh, last, the last year's cohort, uh, which continues this year on the basis that I've laid out to Mr Scott, they are currently a two-year programme. The year before that, there were 346. So it's very much on... Uh, and before that, there were some forerunners to try and test bed it and see if it's an approach that would work. That's, that's designed on the basis of, uh, essentially, you're designing a new model of um, delivery uh, of work-based learning in the school environment in a way that schools aren't used to. And also, frankly, Skills Development Scotland aren't that used to delivering that type of activity with um, schools. So um, you've got to, two different cultures trying to learn from one another, uh, if I can be perfectly candid with you. So uh, to have gone in and said, you know, ultimately I want us to get to the place whereby um, it's embedded as and recognised just a, a normal part of the school offering. We're by no means anywhere close to being uh, there. If we tried to do that from day one, then it just wouldn't have been possible. So it's very much predicated on, on steady and onward growth to get into the final point where I would like us to be, that it is just a recognised part of the school experience. And again, that would help with the point that Mr MacDonald has made about parity of esteem, if we can get to the place whereby foundation apprenticeships are embedded within the school environment, they're recognised as just the normal part of school delivery, then I think we'll break down a lot of these uh, barriers, these issues whereby parents uh, uh, consider that the pursuit of uh, academic education is superior to that of vocational education. I mean, to be fair to parents right now, um, if you've just sent your, your kid to secondary school, you probably, and the, 
the child as well, probably not that aware of what a foundation apprenticeship is. What is it? So it's going to take a while for that to be recognised as as uh, as just an inherent part of, of our school offering. And when we get to that stage, I think we'll we'll have a lot less of this this uh, this concern about parity of esteem. When you say it, it's going to take a while and schools aren't used to foundation apprenticeships, um, College of Scotland and the Chamber of Commerce have said um, that the term foundation leads to confused perceptions. Um, there's been difficulties in, in recruitment due to um, poor promotion. What is the government doing to, to, to tackle that? Um, and, and at the beginning of last year, um, the government pledged 3,000 foundation le level apprenticeships. And then at the end of last year, the start of this year, that figure was reduced to 2,600. Was that figure reduced because of the, the confusion around perceptions of what they actually were? Or was there another reason those figures were reduced? I'll not apologise for setting out um, uh, an ambitious uh, uh, trajectory. What we do need to do constantly is uh, review where we are informed by practical experience. So given that we have had, as I say, uh, 1,245 starts in cohort two, I think the ambition of up to 2,600 it was uh, a stretching uh, one for us uh, this year. I'll not apologise for that because I want to see us continue on that growth uh, trajectory. In terms of the uh, the point that uh, you make, Ms. Fee, around the language, uh, the, how we define it as a foundation apprenticeship, I'm not hung up on the terminology. I would observe that that was the uh, name that was recommended by uh, the report that Ian Wood uh, took forward. But if there's a better name for it, then I'm willing to consider what it might be. That said, I don't want us to go through the constant process of reinvention because if you get to a certain stage where people start to understand something, do we want to change it? Now, to be fair, we may be early enough that we, we can do that. And I do I recognise the point you make because for those of a certain generation who went through standard grades, there was such a thing as a foundation standard grade and um, there were maybe preconceived notions about the value of uh, that form of study, which I won't get into uh, right now, um, but that could be filtering through to the perception of what a foundation apprenticeship might be. So, you know, I'm, I'm all ears. If anyone around this table has a better name for it, then I'm willing to hear it. Target of 5,000 foundation apprenticeships for next year. Are you confident that you'll meet that? We will uh, obviously see how many people have started. And of course, it's up to I think is a point we should make. It's up to this number of starts. I mean, it ultimately is a demand-led um, uh, programme. Uh, so we need to see how many people take up the opportunities this year and we'll, we'll see where we are uh, next year. But right now, uh, that's the basis we're working towards. So if the figure of 5,000 isn't a target, but it's something that you're working towards, if you don't meet the 5,000, wherever you, you peak, that will then become your target? No. So is your target 5,000? It's to provide up to 5,000 places. I want to see as many of them taken up, but of course we need to make our decisions based on practical experience as well. This is a learning process, and I, I, I want to emphasise again the, the, um, the new understanding that has to be between uh, different forms of delivery models. So we've tasked Skills Development Scotland, they're tasked with rolling out foundation apprenticeships, they're used to delivering in a, a certain fashion. Schools are used to delivering in a certain fashion. So we're, we're still working to try and make sure that uh, those cultures of working are, are brought closer together. I've got 5,000 as an, an, an aspiration. It's a, to a degree, it's flexible. It's not about flexibility. It's about trying to offer as many opportunities as possible and then encouraging as many people to take those opportunities. Now, that goes back to the point I, I, I didn't uh, properly answer in your uh, first question. Uh, about um, promoting these opportunities. There probably is more we could be doing to, to promote these opportunities. Again, that's something we are um, tasking Skills of Ireland Scotland with. There's inevitably a role for us as a government. There's a role for uh, COSLA in engaging with their uh, member con constituent local authorities. And there's also a significant role for uh, our 21 developing young workforce regional groups, especially in encouraging employers to take part. We can only offer these opportunities if we have employers willing to provide those opportunities. 
you know, we can go out and we put the contracts in place for the training provision. That's um, the sort of straightforward part of it. The more difficult task is getting employers to engage. Now they are doing so, we need more to do so. And then thereafter getting young people to engage with the opportunity. Okay, because SDS last week when I asked this question, they are confident that 5,000 foundation apprenticeships will, will be delivered. It sounds as if they're more confident than, than government. If your target's up to, but they were quite confident last week that well, they would be delivering 5,000 opportunities next year. I'm always pleased and heartened to hear about the confidence of uh, Scottish government agencies in delivering the programmes we entrust them with. Okay. Uh, Ms Mackay? Yes, thank you. Um, just following on from that slightly, um, you've, you've talked about the promotion of the foundation apprenticeships and, and what you're doing to promote them and, and how to get, you're trying to get the balance right. Um, do you think schools are doing enough um, to promote them? Because there was some concern that they were sort of undermining the motivation in some aspects and of course some of them may be looking towards their um, figures as far as you know un university uh, figures go. So do you think schools are fully on board with this to get them embedded into the system? Um, it will be mixed. If I can be candid with you, it will be patchy because, well, for two reasons. One, um, the opportunities are such. They're now available in every local authority area. That's significant progress. Um, they're available in, if I remember correctly, um, uh, virtually all of Scotland's secondary uh, schools. Uh, but not every framework is available across every local authority area. Not every framework is available in every uh, school environment. So... That's why it's so important for us to continue to grow the offering. As we grow the offering, as we grow the number of opportunities, then uh, I think schools will start to see, actually, this is a real opportunity for uh, young people to take up. That said, where we are offering them, um, they are being uh, pursued by an increasing number of young people. So that says to me that uh, schools are uh, doing two things. They are letting young people know about it. And even more importantly, uh, they're facilitating their participation through flexibility in timetabling, which is no small undertaking for a school. I recognise that, but they are they are doing that to allow young people to take part in foundation apprenticeships. But yes, of course, there's more that every part of the system can be doing to promote them. And what um, plans or progress do you have to measure? You know how how this is growing and the success of the the system. Is that is there a way you you capturing data about you know how many schools are, are the uptake of it and and apprenticeships. Yeah. Yes, we can we can measure all that. So, um, if the committee's interested, we can provide uh, detail of what's been available over the Pathfinder projects and the two uh, intakes, the two cohorts of intakes that we've had thus far. And um, I was asked this question by, um, I think it was Ian Gray in the chamber. Will we make information public available on participation in? Foundation apprenticeship, uh, apprenticeships going forward, of course, will. So it'll all be publicly available. Because I'm interested in the, you know, when you have that information, if there's any geographical differences. In my local authority area, the schools are high achieving and pride themselves on the number of university entrants that, that you know, they've got. So I'd be interested to find out what the, 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 you know, the differences are throughout the country or within each local authority area on that, um, and how, how close are we to getting any kind of sense of that or any figures? They will differ, but we can break it down by local authority area. I can provide that to the committee so we can understand that very uh, readily. It is, um, it will only be sort of raw statistical data, so trying to get underneath what's driving that um, requires um, a wider piece of work. I wouldn't want to draw too many conclusions at this stage because, as I say, we are still at the stage of growing the number of them. So, uh, you know, I've been pleased with the, the growth we've seen. To go from 346 uh, starts two years ago to 1,245 last year, um, I think any reasonable person would say, well, that's substantial growth in terms of your starting point. That said, to try and draw... Um, wider conclusions from 1,245 starts, I think, would not be the most informative thing uh, to do. I think the critical thing for us right now is to get out there and to promote uh, uh, foundation apprenticeships and <coughs> uh, vocational learning in its wider sense as something that is of significant value for each school environment to 
to uh, to um, participate in. Um, and even for uh, Ms Mackay represents the uh, the constituent next door to mine, so obviously she knows her area much better than I do, but I'm aware of um, the, her area and, yeah, there are obviously schools that there that are doing significantly well in terms of academic attainment. But don't tell me that there isn't, aren't kids that are being left behind in those schools. There are. And we need to make sure that they are supported yeah. as well. Yeah. And we need to make sure they are supported and through things like uh, attainment fund, pupil equity fund, so that they can have better academic attainment, but also uh, so that um, they can have positive outcomes in the labour markets. So that speaks of the necessity of ensuring that we have a, a good vocational offering as well. Although, again, that shouldn't be just targeted at uh, those who might not um, have good academic attainment, because I've seen enough young people out there um, who have now got five A's uh, at their hires, did significantly better than I did at school on that basis, who then have, because they've decided it's a good opportunity for them, gone on to do a modern apprenticeship. And you know that, that's, that should, that's a legitimate option for them to pursue. So the way I look at it, ultimately, Convener, is, is about ensuring that young people are as informed as possible of all the options they have before them, can make informed decisions, and recognise, explicitly recognise, that each of those options are as valid as the next. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Greer. Mr. Um, you might be aware the Education Scotland Review of Personal Social Education, which came as a result of an inquiry that uh, this committee undertook, um, has published its phase two results. And what they found was that the um, caseload of a guidance teacher in Scotland varies between about 75 and 280 young people. I think the average is, is around 200. Given the importance of guidance teachers in successfully implementing this agenda, do you think that a guidance teacher with a caseload of between 200 and 280 can provide the level of one-to-one -one support that young people require? I think we should be clear. I mean, I want all teachers, starting with in a specific school environment, head teacher, uh, I was about to say downwards, that's probably not the right way to describe it. All teachers within each school environment, through the leadership of their head teacher to embrace the developing the young workforce agenda. Uh, I think we're starting uh, to see that. I think we should be clear though, yes, um, our guidance teachers play a critical role in supporting young people. We are not discharging the responsibility for delivery of developing young workforce specifically in guidance teachers. So it's for each head teacher to identify, um, it's described uh, as senior resource within their school environment to take forward the developing young workforce agenda. That may or may not be a guidance teacher. Uh, I would rather suspect, um, I say boldly without having the evidence in front of me, that it won't be guidance teachers in the main who are discharged with us. Although, of course, guidance teachers are invariably also subject matter teachers uh, as well. Um, so, uh, to be clear, it's not guidance teachers that are specifically tasked with taking this agenda forward. There is also, there has been a question about how, can we better support individual school schools to uh, roll out um, the developing young workforce agenda uh, with additional uh, support. So one of the things we're about to pilot in a number of schools in the Glasgow area is uh, a new member of staff who um, will not probably be a member of teaching staff uh, to be charged with rolling out and taking forward developing the young workforce within their specific school environment. So um, I, th I hope that provides reassurance. Yes, I would recognise that um, guidance teachers to varying degrees in different schools caseloads probably not the right term, but I can't think of a better term, significant caseloads, significant number of young people that are supporting, and ultimately they're supporting all young people uh, to a greater or lesser degree within uh, school. But we are not uh, seeking to uh, add the burden of uh, the specific delivery of developing young workforce entirely on the shoulders of guidance teachers. I accept that, absolutely, Minister. It's not entirely their responsibility, but given the guidance teacher has the primary responsibility for one-to-one -one support of the young people who are, and 
caseload would be a term that the association guidance teachers would, would use, so it's appropriate terminology. There is an importance there. Um, but to, to move to um, SDS careers advisors, um, we've, as a committee, very consistently, not just in the course of this inquiry, but over the last number of years, uh, heard substantial amounts of anecdotal evidence from young people um, about where the uh, choice available to them is perhaps not really a choice, that nominally a school might offer more options for their future pathways than they had done previously, but on an individual level, the decision has already been made for that young person, and they feel that other people have made that for them. Um, when education, uh, when Skills Development Scotland ran last week, I was asking them about this, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on where a careers advisor sees that happening in a school, where they see that young people are not being given the individual choice that they should, what role would you expect the careers advisor to take there? What level of engagement would you expect them to have with the school to address that situation? Well, I would expect them primarily to engage with the young person to offer them the information, advice and guidance that they would require to make an informed decision. I would absolutely concede. I've heard the same point made. Um, young people do often feel that they're not given the fullest information that they might require to make uh, decisions about subject choice um, that will um, uh, allow them to proceed through school, get the qualifications they require to, to move on to a career of, of their choice, um, or they're just not made available, uh, made aware of the availability of different uh, career options for them. So I hear that too, and that was um, a huge part of the reason why we tasked Ian Wood and the Commission to come up with uh, the Developing Young Workforce recommendations, and that's a critical part and a critical element of developing the young workforce a strategy. I mean, you ultimately you'd have to leave it to the the individual judgment of a uh, um, careers advisor as to how they would approach that matter. Um, you know, equally they they can't be imposing anything on a, a young person as well. It fundamentally goes back to the the culture of uh, our educational environment is about ensuring that uh, parents, teachers, and young people are all aware of. The variety of options that they uh, that are out there, the variety of pathways that there are, and just as the developing the young workforce uh, group in Glasgow said, there is no wrong path. Make make it very clear early on that uh, each of the options available is of equivalent value uh, to the next. You're right, Minister, that the advisor's primary responsibility is to the individual young people. If they have observed a structural or a cultural problem within a school like this, do you believe that that's something that they should be taking up with the management of the school or with the local authority? Is this a discussion they should be engaging staff in? I hope any school environment is structured in a way that any person who's wor working there should be able to raise issues of concern with the senior management team. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lamont? Yeah, um, I just want to through this issue about entitlement of young people in terms of careers advice. What proportion of, of um, young people have, uh, can expect one-to-one -one support from careers advisors? Um, now, my memory of that is that it should be available to all young people. That's what we were told last week. But okay. So that might be something you might want to come back to us on, because clearly... be mistaken. Yeah. Um, so... Because we were concerned, well, I certainly was concerned that there was a conflation between one-to-one -one and face-to-face. -face. Do you have a definition of what face-to-face -face careers advice is? Uh, my definition of face-to-face -face uh, would be, as we are right now, sitting not necessarily across the table from one another, but speaking to each other face-to-face. -face. Although in some environments I would recognise, going back to the points that have been raised about the challenges of rurality, that might not be possible. And you might have to use some other means to facilitate that discussion. Is there a limit in the number of young people in the room when you're having a face-to-face -face support from a careers advisor? I can't answer that question. But it's actually, would you accept it's relevant that if the careers service is saying we offer face-to-face -face and it turns out it's one um, occasion with 30 other people in the room, that would be literally meaningless in terms of actually supporting young persons' ability to make decisions? I think it would rather depend. So actually, I had the pleasure of going to North Berwick High School where they have um, a careers advisor in there that uh, essentially takes a, a, 
more or less like a class offering careers guidance and my uh, estimation of that approach was it was working there. I suppose the fundamental point is, and maybe this is where I was um, uh, slightly mistaken in terms of the way I uh, answered your first question, is that every young person who wants to request face-to-face -face meetings should be uh, entitled to be able to get that. Um, but, no, I mean, if, if that was the only, if it precluded the opportunity for a young person to get that type of approach and it was only offered as a room of 30 people, then that probably would not be that effective. That's something that you'd be willing to look at. I mean, apart from anything else, if it's one-to-one -one on the basis that you ask for it, my view would be that those perhaps who most need it are least likely to ask and least likely to be in a position to ask and be accepted. This may actually... Um, reinforce inequalities in terms of awareness about what options are available. I mean, I think that would be. I, mean, I just think we would. It would be helpful to us to know what you think an entitlement to one-to-one -one, um, consultation is, and whether that's the same as um, what was advised us last week. And in terms to face-to-face, -to -face, clearly somebody coming in and saying, giving a presentation on X, Y, and Z is quite different from what the implication of face-to-face -face is, which is there is an engagement, there's a dialogue about what options are available to you. And I suppose, Matt, in, in responding to this, would you accept that the challenge is to deliver a career advice service to individuals that meet their individual abilities in the context of big numbers of young people? Yes, I mean, that's the, the, the fundamental point you make at the end is what we should have as a, a, an offering for our careers information and guidance. We've already committed through a programme for government to have a review of um, a, a, a careers information. So that, that's something that we're, we're, we're doing, um, or committed to doing. Uh, in terms of the specific points that you've raised, I'm very happy to take them on board. I suppose um, I'd want um, some of it to be evidenced, although I would agree with uh, the perspective that um, we would need to make sure that the young people who needed the information advice most felt confident enough to ask for it. Um, of course, that should involve them being reminded that they're entitled to ask for it. And if that isn't happening, then we need to look at that and we need to ensure that our systems work so that young people... I mean, I've spoke several times now about making sure that young people are as informed as possible. And ultimately, this has to be part of the information that's relayed to them, that they are entitled to, to this form of, of guidance. Do you my concern, then, that the phrase that was used last week on face-to-face -face actually masks the challenge to the careers advice service because it can capture such a, you know, a, an event where there's one advisor and up to maybe 30 young people? I think I would need to see the comment before I draw any conclusions as to whether I shared your concern. I suppose I would make the point make the point again that I don't think it's necessarily inappropriate for a group of young people to be to be brought together to have some form of careers information and guidance. Uh, if that was the only form available to them, then yes, that would be a concern. Would you want to look at the extent to which, for some young people, that is the only option they have, given that the one-to-one -one, um, provision is, from what we heard last week, um, different. It's not universal. Uh, what I can undertake to do is see what information and evidence we have to see if there is uh, a systemic problem of that nature. Uh, I've not been made aware that that is the case, um, but we can certainly have a look at it. Uh, Dr. Allen. Um, thank you. Um, obviously, our recurring theme today has been about uh, parity of esteem and what um, developing young workforce had to say about uh, encouraging um, a, a better understanding of, of uh, uh, options other than university. Um, I was keen to know whether you felt there was any measurable uh, data or even anecdote that would, that would suggest that young people's own experience of this um, reflects that ideal uh, in their school experience? Have we anything to go on that would suggest that the attitudes are, are improving in terms of, of, of uh, the amount of information that is provided about non-university options? Or when will that be measurable? Or is it like the French Revolution, too early to tell? <laughs> um, 
I've not drawn my own conclusions in the French Revolution yet either, uh, Dr. Allen. Um, certainly the evidence uh, in terms of the numbers, of the proportion of young people who are um, utilising college-based study in the senior phase of the school environment uh, would testify that there's, there, well, there's growth there. And the growth in foundation apprenticeships would testify that uh, more uh, young people are becoming aware of and availing themselves of the opportunity of work-based vocational uh, learning. Uh, so we can look at that in terms of the statistical information we have. In terms of the um, their awareness of the opportunities, that's a harder thing to measure, but I would um, go back to, I think it was in response to Mr Greer, say that um, I too frequently hear young people saying that they haven't been made aware of all of the options. Now, a lot of those young people are, have actually not long come out of uh, the, the school system and are at the next phase of their, their lives. So the challenge for us is probably to ensure that we keep engaging with young people, which we are doing through the 15 to 24 Learner Journey Review um, in terms of the work that we undertook uh, thus far. We worked with uh, a young Scott uh, to uh, towards that end. Um, we are going to continue to work with them and they're going to engage with YouthLink to ensure that they continue to inform the work that we take forward through the 1524 Learner Journey Review. And one of the other things, again, uh, to demonstrate that we learn from practical experience, um, one of the things that Rob Woodward actually raised with me is perhaps we should be trying to ensure that there's uh, at least one young person uh, on each of the, the regional groups so that we can probably better understand what uh, the lived experience of young people in relation to the, the information and advice they're offered uh, actually is. But uh, to, to be candid right now, uh, yes, I will hear young people say that they haven't been properly or fully informed of the opportunities that they, they have. Again, this may be, and it's related to that, may be difficult to measure too, but I just wonder, a number of, of people here today, I think yourself included, have, have, have referred to the, the reality of, of parental attitudes and sometimes parental pressures around choices that, that young people make. Um, is there anything you feel that is being done or can be done to try and, in a sense, educate parents as, as, as one of the, the biggest pressures on, on young people who are making these decisions to, to encourage <coughs> parents to see these things in, in the same way and, and to have an idea of parity of esteem? Well, I would go back to, <coughs> excuse me, I, can, I would go back to the, um, the answer I gave you earlier in relation to the significant body of work that uh, SDS engaged in in terms of uh, ensuring that parents are, are better aware of uh, the opportunities that young people uh, have uh, through careers, uh, information and guidance. So that work is, is uh, happening um, and it will continue. And I suppose the final, the, the counter argument, if you like, to that, and again, I think you may have alluded to this, but um, there are still young people who have parental pressure from the opposite direction, obviously, people who may be the first person in their family to, to think about going on to, to college or university, who, who face not a lack of parental support, but um, parents who find that to be a high-risk option for various reasons, who have a, an obstacle to overcome. I, I take it from what you're saying that we're, we don't want to lose sight of, of the, the, the pressures that exist from the opposite direction. Is there anything that you're doing to try and make sure that doesn't happen? Absolutely. So um, not, well, part, partly through the Developing Young Workforce activity in terms of ensuring that uh, young people are aware of all the options they have. But uh, clearly that's a critical element of the uh, widening access work that I'm not leading on, uh, but the committee will be uh, aware of in terms of uh, access to higher education. Uh, so yes, that uh, firmly remains in the radar. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Clover. Um, I'd like to go back to something you said at the start with regard to SDS now attending parents' evenings, uh, and in your response to Alistair Allen there, we're also you also spoke about. Um, engaging parents, and I note the National Parents Forum submission talks about expectations on parents, but obviously government can't enforce parents to engage. If they don't want to engage, they might not engage. But what government does have control over is the consistency of offer across the country. So um, in a line of questioning to SES last week, I asked about 
what their average expectation might be on careers advisors in terms of how many hours they were spending in school. Do you have an understanding of that nationally? Is that data available to you in terms of an average careers officer, a uh, careers guidance uh, officer, in terms of what their engagement level is with schools? Um, I don't have it before me now. Uh, I can't say with 100% certainty it does exist, but we can certainly commit to, to looking at that and seeing what information there is. Okay. Um, I know I understand that SDS have a number of hubs that are available nationally. Um, the expectation from SDS is that half a day is spent in those hubs. Would your expectation be at government level that these officers are out and about in schools more regularly than they are in these hubs? Um, not necessarily, because there is also... Um, the hubs that exist are uh, of high quality and also of great value in terms of people's ability to not just young people incidentally of a person's ability to come in off the street and seek some form of information and guidance uh, there as well so uh, I do think we have to strike the right balance we'll always be willing to look and see whether that has been uh, struck but I think it's an entirely appropriate thing for them also to base some of their activities at hubs. Because the, the good work's done from there as well. So I was able to go to, I've been able to go to a number, but I remember being at the uh, hub that, that SDS operate in Inverness, where they were able to bring a number of young people out of the school environment to there for um, uh, some practical hands-on uh, information and advice and employers can come in there and, and engage with uh, young people too so there's there's i believe also a, a role for that type of activity okay and um, i'd like to move on a wee bit to look at gender segregation which come come up um again last week and we considered with sds i suppose in terms of subject uptake which is still a pressing concern and with regard to apprenticeships as well are you able to tell us a little bit about the government's work around about tackling gender segregation on that issue uh, yes, um, this is uh, an issue of uh, significant concern to us and that's we're taking a range of activity to try because ultimately it manifests itself negatively uh, in a variety of ways, most obviously in terms of the gender pay gap and that's the, uh, the uh, clear manifestation of the uh, segregation uh, by gender we see in subject choice and uh, occupational uh, choice or at least uh, occupational outcomes because it isn't always necessarily by choice it's people uh, picking careers around their wider life circumstances so yes we're trying to do what we can in terms of uh, um, the stem strategy to make sure that we're engaging with uh, young people at an early age so that more uh, young girls can be aware of the value of studying stem uh, subjects uh, there is activity underway there um, the stem strategy uh, which uh, my colleague Richard Lockhead will uh, lead on. It was taken forward by Shirley Ann Somerville when she occupied the, uh, the uh, role of Minister for uh, Further Education, Higher Education and Science. Uh, he will be taking that forward now. Uh, the same strategy continues to be rolled out. And in terms of apprenticeships, uh, there is um, work through the Equalities Action Plan that uh, Skills Realm Scotland are working towards. I should say uh, we are inclined to think of uh, this and I think we should primarily think of this as trying to encourage more women into uh, areas like STEM, STEM primarily uh, but of course we also must be doing more to encourage uh, more men into what are viewed as traditionally uh, female uh, sectors such as early years, learning and childcare, there are a whole host of good reasons uh, to do that not least because we are significantly ramping up the number of hours that will be provided and we need to recruit significantly more people so we shouldn't be overlooking half of the population and doing so there as well so um, this is an important role activities underway and we'll continue to take it forward um, just lastly on that gender segregation in schools I don't know if you can answer this point but does the government have a view with regard to uh, gender balancing classes in schools so for example could it be it is still the case that you could have a class of physics students at national five level where or at higher level where there's only one girl for example does the government have a view on that and issuing guidance to schools to stop that from happening uh, no I don't think we do um, I, I don't think we could I don't know how that would work on a practical level. I think it's far more important that we undertake the activity I've set out to encourage more young women to study subjects like physics. Now, that said, there is probably more that could be done to support 
um, young women who may find themselves in such a circumstance. And I'm aware of, uh, certainly, probably not at a school level so much, but at a, a higher education level, there's been networks formed of women studying, in fact, it is physics, so that they can uh, engage with, that, uh, with one another, even if they're not necessarily at the same uh, institution. Um, but uh, I'm not convinced that taking that type of approach would necessarily be one that would be um, effective. Uh, Ms Fee, you wanted to come in on care experience? Yeah. Um, thank you, convener. I, I wanted to um, ask the Minister about support that's available for care experienced um, young people. And again, it's a question I raised with um, panel last week. Um, the Minister will be aware that quite often care experienced young people have quite um, complex um, needs. Um, and their, um, the percentage of care experienced young people that reach positive destinations is, is quite low and it's only increased, it's, it's increased by less than, than 2%. So what specific support is available? And specifically for care experienced young people, what support is there to, to, to help and support them? Um, in terms of the proportion of young people with experience of care, and it paused destination from our baseline figure. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, don't have it to hand now, uh, but I think it's increased by more than 2%. But I don't underestimate the scale of the challenge. It's, it's somewhere um, roughly around, I think, 20 percentage points lower than the population as a whole. That's clearly, totally and utterly unacceptable because, again, it manifests itself in terms of poor outcomes, not just in the labour market, but in life in its wider sense for for young people with the experience of uh, care. One of the things that um, the Deputy First Minister is leading on, uh, he is trying to make sure that all government policy is uh, informed by being aware of adverse childhood experiences, uh, particularly uh, discharging his responsibility for the education and skills system. Uh, and in that uh, regard, he um, held a very <coughs> excuse me, uh, a very uh, uh, compelling uh, conference uh, at Bella Houston Academy in Glasgow a number of months ago, which I attended, uh, all education ministers attended, and a number of uh, other cabinet secretaries and ministers attended uh, to discuss how we can ensure that we are better aware of adverse childhood experiences and experience of care uh, being uppermost amongst them because if you're care experienced invariably there are other reasons for that so you have had a number of adverse childhood experiences. In terms of uh, support that we can provide uh, of course we will continue to um, determine what we can uh, do. Uh, one of the things that I have done is for example in modern apprenticeships uh, I have ensured that uh, people with experience of care can get the highest level or qualify for the highest level of payment for an employer uh, for their training, um, uh, for the training provider uh, to up to the age of 29 uh, uh, across all uh, frameworks. That's not the case for every uh, person uh, entering our modern <coughs> friendship frameworks. So that's one practical way in which we're trying to encourage uh, employers to take on more uh, people with experience of care. There's also work underway. I don't have the full details, but we could get that in terms of how we can better support young people with uh, care experience uh, through the tertiary education system as well. So we are alert to this agenda. We're aware that we ha still have some distance uh, to go. Um, there is also a wider body of work being taken forward at the First Minister's request, looking at how we can better support um, uh, people with experience of uh, the care system uh, across all areas of government. And again, we can provide more details to the committee of, of that work as well. I mean, further information on um, any initiatives that, that, that are currently available would be really useful. Um, be, because it, it comes back to a point that um, Ms Lamont raised earlier about um, careers advice. Quite often, um, the lack of um, availability of one-to-one of -one may be something that initially disadvantages care experienced young people. They, they come from a, a, a background where they, they, they may not be as, as confident 
um, they may need that additional support. They, they may be less likely to come forward and identify. So all of these things should, should be in place. And, and the, um, the scheme that you talked about in relation to apprenticeships is welcome, but something like that should be in place to support care experience children, whatever destination they, they choose to go into. So uh, SDS launched its new corporate parent plan uh, earlier this year. It's setting out a, a number of um, areas of activity. There is There should be an enhanced offer, uh, uh, careers offer for um, young people with uh, care experience by SDS in terms of uh, careers information and guidance. But we are undertaking a range of other, and of course, um, uh, young people generally who are at risk of uh, disengaging or disengagement uh, should be um, getting uh, case managed by Skills Development Scotland. So they should be um, uh, supported through the system we have in place already. In terms of uh, other specific forms of activity, uh, we are now working with MCR Pathways, for example, in Glasgow, who are supporting uh, young people with experienced care. They're a, a very impressive organisation led by a man named Ian McRitchie, who um, would be well worth the committee actually contacting because he has uh, taken forward a very impressive uh, programme, uh, doing fantastic work supporting young people with uh, experience of the care system uh, and achieving very positive outcomes for them. So that's work we are beginning uh, to support uh, and we're also working with who cares uh, scotland in terms of uh, trying to offer uh, work placement opportunities as well so there is there's work underway there's activity happening inevitably the more we can do and we will always seek to do what we can to uh, support uh, people who've been in the care system who after all uh, we uh, should be uh, what should be uppermost in our minds is that we have a fundamental responsibility to because at some stage in their life, and it could be have been for quite a substantial part of their life, uh, the state was discharged with responsibility for caring for them. Because I, I asked the, the, the question specifically to SDS last week, and they spoke about assessments and needs-based um, matrices, but were unable to give me an example of anything that they did that was specifically targeted at care experience young people. So I'm, I'm grateful for the information that the Minister's been able to give me today. Pointing they couldn't, because I've just been able to, so. Yeah, thank you. Ms Harris. Yes. I think I'm Minister, but Could I just go back to the, you know, the, the DY, the DYW experience and just ask you, you know, what is the Scottish Government doing really to make it easier for business to actually support work experience? You know, and I'm thinking really in particular, you know, if you think of professions like medicine, etc., you know, how, how is the government helping, you know, the more disadvantaged get in to get work experience in these professions? What can the government do? Well, I, I, that would go back. Well, we're dealing with that in a variety of ways. So um, there is a view in Glasgow, for example, the um, city council. Uh, runs a, a mentoring uh, scheme and the government is an active participant in that and is offered and they pair up with a specific school so um, I'm just going to ask you, it's John Paul Academy John Paul Academy in Somerston um, that uh, we uh, support uh, so yes the public sector can absolutely be playing a role, National Health Service could be, although of course we need to be cognizant that uh, they are um, uh, uh, obviously very busy, but uh, we need to facilitate as much employee engagement as possible with um, with young people, with schools, and that's something we have asked our developing young workforce regional groups to do. Now, if there's any particular impediment barrier identified, then that's something we will want to hear about and something we want to try and uh, bring down because uh, we want to ensure that employers across the board, across all sectors, can be in there as part of this agenda. Okay, thank you. And how, how would you ensure that really best practice would be replicated across all local authorities? Um, what Rob Woodward, who I mentioned earlier, uh, does is he brings together <coughs> all of the chairs of the, uh, the um, regional groups together on a regular basis. He also brings together all of those who are essentially employed by the regional groups as the uh, development leads. They, they have different 
titles, but essentially they are tasked with uh, developing uh, the, the offer within their particular region. Who bring them all together and they have a dialogue to learn from one another what they're doing, what's working well, what's not working so well, and they can they can uh, they can link uh, they can link up and, and learn from one another. So that is something that's written through our system. We also have the Developing Young Workforce National Advisory Group, which is jointly chaired by the Deputy First Minister and um, a, Stephen McCabe, Councillor Stephen McCabe from Inverclyde Council, who leads on education young people for COSLA. They jointly chair that. I sit on that group uh, as well. And they will also be uh, looking to hear what has been effective and can try and advise and inform what our offering at a national level should be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just following on from um, that question, uh, Minister, um, with the regional operation of developing young workforce, obviously the regional opportunities can be quite different across Scotland. If we're talking about oil and gas in the North East or in, in some of the um, fintech industries in Edinburgh, for instance, that maybe aren't available to um, the other regions. And I'm, I'm thinking about the development of the, the fourth industrial revolution and how automation will um, change practically every area of our lives from care, manufacturing and in all of these areas. And I just wondered if there had, had been any work to ensure that we weren't um, repeating a regional disadvantage for people and, and, and how we were getting information um, about opportunities elsewhere in Scotland to, to areas where particularly there were, there were problems. I know it's difficult because there is a an element of work experience, and that's a geographic element to this, but, but are we how do we make sure that the opportunities um, for, for young people, are, that are aware of all the opportunities across Scotland? Well, I, I mean, fundamentally, I'll go back to the information and guidance that they are provided, uh, hopefully as early as uh, possible. Um, I mean, there is an inherent tension. And we've got, I do accept we've got to get the balance right, but fundamentally, developing the young workforce is delivered on the ground regionally and it is designed to make sure that young people are aware of, of what's happening locally but also to give them experience on a sector by sector basis so they could acquire skills with a local employer that's transferable to an employer uh, elsewhere. Um, so we need to try and strike that balance because you will be aware um, and some members around the table will be more aware than the others because they represent these very communities that there is a common concern in our remote and rural communities that young people have to, uh, to have to leave to, to get uh, employment opportunities elsewhere. Sometimes that's true, um, but from what I am now encountering, sometimes that's a perception more than a reality. There are actually opportunities in those communities that young people aren't always availing themselves of. So we need to make sure that they are aware of those opportunities to sustain and help support local employers, local economies, to try and ensure that we that young people don't feel they have to, to leave a particular area. But equally, yes, they, they must be aware that there is a wider world there. And if they want to uh, go elsewhere, then they should have that opportunity too. Dr. Allen, you get supplementary. Uh, on that point, and I, I very much agree with what you're saying there about the, the two realities of, 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 I don't like the word remote, but remote and, and island communities. Um, one is that the lack of opportunities sometimes, but sometimes, as you've said, the, the lack of awareness of what the jobs are. I, I, I wonder if you could comment on a situation that may be common in other island communities as well. But where, if you're a young person who's thinking about perhaps coming back from university to an island community, Certainly in the Western Isles, there is no list of the available jobs in the Western Isles anywhere obvious for anyone to go to. Um, is there anything more that can be done at a sort of practical level simply to make people uh, aware of a list of vacant jobs? Pro probably. I mean, Skills Development Scotland will have a role in there. They need to be up. And um, Scottish Enterprise, or in, in uh, Dr Allen's case and Mr Scott's case, uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, want to use their uh, labour market intelligence to know what's available. They should be working with the raft of account managed companies they have to know what is becoming available. Then they can work with Skills Development Scotland to ensure that they can help uh, supply the, the labour to fill 
those opportunities. Um, and clearly the work that we're doing through the, uh, the skills and enterprise agencies uh, review and now the work that's emanated from that can have a role to play uh, there. So if, if there's more that can be done, we'll be willing to, to listen to that. But certainly my um, hope would be that would be happening uh, right now. There should be no impediment to it anyway. Thank you. Uh, um, Mr Scott, did you want to come in finally on the resourcing? Can I just ask a few questions, or a couple of questions, if I may, Minister, on your letter to the committee of the 20th of September, which went on, which looked at the funding streams under the 1819 budget. And if I get this right, there are seven, diff seven uh, different funding streams coming to £12 million or so. And would I also be fair in saying that there's also potentially ESF funding that local authorities and other groups will be applying to, and one or two other things as well? In other words... Is the landscape too messy? Does this need to be... Simple? You may have got this question when you are in Shetland, but is, is there too much going on here in terms of no matter how good the regional um, de 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 developing young workforce group is and the local authority, there's a heck of a lot going on here. Uh, some of it's bid funding, some of it's formula funding, some of it's administered by SDS, which means a huge amount of bureaucracy. Do you think there's a bit of a chance to, uh, to coin Dr Allen and take the guillotine to some of this? Paraphrase. Yeah, I think it was paraphrasing Dr. Allen, but I'm, I'm, I'm always willing to wind up Dr. Allen as well, Mr. Scott. Um, this was actually, not only was it, I can't actually recall if it was a question that came up in Shetland, if truth be told, but it was certainly a question that came up at the Economy Jobs and, and Fair Work Committee uh, yesterday when I was giving evidence about um, employability programmes. I think it manifests itself there actually more than in the particular landscape that we operate for, for um, within the school environment through developing young workforce. But certainly through our employability programmes, it can be a bit of a confused landscape. Now, that's not to say that any individual element of it isn't doing good things. In fact, I cannot think of um, any element that I've encountered that I've thought, well, that's a waste of time. They're all doing uh, good and valuable work. Uh, how coherent it might be is, um, well, I don't think it's up for question. I think it, it needs to be more coherent, and that's why we've uh, undertaken the, uh, the No One Left Behind agenda in terms of reviewing the various employability initiatives, which will not exclusively be for young people, but some of them are geared towards uh, young people, to make sure that uh, there is reduced duplication and fundamentally actually to make sure there's greater awareness of what each offering is because one of the big challenges I have, and I set this out yesterday, is that uh, a lot of, in fact, the lion's share of delivery is vested through local authorities and I don't know what each local authority is doing. So one of the things I've done is, on the back of no one left behind, <coughs> is uh, right to COSLA to... Uh, seek um, an agreement that we work together on a common basis um, to ensure that we have that more coherent system. We'll need to work with others as well, the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, they, they have committed that they will take part and we'll also need to work with the, th the third sector and various providers as well. And fundamentally, of course, those people who go through those programmes. Bringing it back to the, the formal learning environment, of course, this is also an element of activity through the 15 to 24 learner journey review. That's probably not so much about there being a sort of cluttered landscape. That's probably more about the individual route a person might take. And maybe there's a bit of concern that some people aren't taking as straight uh, a journey as they possibly could in terms of their ability to articulate from one part of the system to the next. There are enough people who qualify through an HND going on to the next element of higher education if they choose to at the, the appropriate level. Possibly not. So these are things that we're looking at through that particular work as well. So for, for the nineteen twenty budget uh, financial year next year, would would it be your intention to to have that work um, concluded and therefore for us to see a, a change in how this is currently structured? Uh, clearly, we're still going through the budget process. So I've got to be careful what I say. Um, right now, my working assumption is there will be some changes. It will not be revolutionary uh, next year it won't be you know, yet now I'm engaging in the, the talk of the French Revolution as well or could we talk about another revolution um, it will not it be uh, wholesale it won't be complete um, there will be some changes probably uh, but a lot of the elements of what we have in place just now will remain 
Thank you. Uh, and Ms Lamont. Thank you very much. I just wanted to go back to a previous discussion about a definition of a positive destination, and I, and I noted your um, letter, which says that you know, the UK government or the Department of Work and Pensions doesn't give you the right information, and the right information is not sought by... Um, HMRC around DWP. OK, um, by I'm skills... I'm willing to criticise the DWP, but probably okay, not in this on, case. I mean, why they wouldn't want to share the information, I don't know. But anyway, um, and Skills Development Scotland doesn't ask for the right information. Can you confirm it's still the Scottish Government's view that a zero-hours contract is not fair work? An exploitative zero-hours contract is not uh, part of our fair work agenda. So if Absolutely. you were able to get the information, you would not define a zero-hours contract as a positive destination? It, well, I've obviously set out in writing this came directly as a result of uh, your question to me at, I think it was my last appearance at the committee, uh, to look at how we can better understand what um, the destinations are for young people. Now, there are, and you yourself have very concretely conceded, Ms Lamb, there could be, and we have identified inherent difficulties in doing so, because we're we can measure the proportion of people in the overall workforce that are on a zeroes contract on a, an estimated basis through the, uh, the labour force survey, but that is a sample survey. How we measure post-school destinations, we call them positive destinations now. They've not always been called that, of course. They were, uh, there was a different uh, reference in the past in terms of measuring those not in employment, education and training. Um, that's done not through a sample basis. And I think that's a strength of our system. We can literally work out where people have gone. So I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to lose that um, uh, to move towards, um, move if towards you, If you can a, identify a specifically basis. where people have gone, yes. it can't be much of a leap of imagination to work out whether they're in a zero hours contract or not. I can assure you, young people know when they're in a zero hours contract. They know when they're at the mercy well, of being on the rota or not. Yeah. But if I can maybe, I mean, I just think it would be really important that we have a sense that you would do whatever you could not to distort the figures on positive destinations with jobs that, frankly, we would all agree are neither um, offering training or stability or guarantees of ours. Uh, we're not distorting the figures. I want to make that very clear. The figures are um, robust. They're the, the figures that uh, we've laid out. I, I mean, positive destinations is the terminology we use. Uh, inherent within any form of terminology we use, they could be argued to be loaded terms. So previously we used not an employment, education or training. We could go revert back to that, but that then became a, a pejorative term for those who were not in employment or training. They were referred to as needs. So I don't want to get caught up too much in terms of of uh, what we define as a positive destination or not. What well, I am committed to doing, if I can ask the question, Ms Lamont, and I've committed in writing, I'll commit here again, is to doing everything we can to better understand what the destination figures mean. And that includes us uh, trying to do what we can to establish how many young people might end up on what is termed a zero hours contract. Same. Now, in terms of the point you have made of young people absolutely understanding they're in a zeroes contract. I think largely I would probably agree with that, but um, we are also, that's usually informed by the, on the basis of we're engaging with those who are campaigning organisations who do well understand what a zeroes contract might be. Um, so I, I, I suppose it's the point I'm trying to make is this is not as straightforward as we might at first glance uh, think it might be, but my commitment remains to look at this. I've set that in writing. We're continuing to do so. And I'll be happy to come back to the committee at the earliest opportunity to see where we're getting to with that. I very much welcome that last point you make. I would make the point, I mean, I understand what you say about pejorative terms, that not in employment, um, education or training was seen as pejorative, but pretty accurate. Whereas a positive destination for somebody in a zero hours contract is not accurate. And I actually do think that young people who are sitting waiting for the rota to come out in the email know exactly what their limits and their rights are. But in terms of taking it forward, I wonder what conversations you've had with business in your definition of what fair work is, because I'm concerned that increasingly businesses see zero hours contracts not as a way of managing the edges of their business, but as core, um, a, a core approach to zero hours contracts. What conversations are you having? And in terms of careers advice, what role does careers advice have in empowering young people 
to define what is reasonable for them to expect from their work and what a zero hours contract is. And critically, the role of trade unions in enforcing young people's rights, because actually one of the big gaps around zero hours contracts is not so much that there are not rights, there are not employment rights for some young people, but they don't know how to enforce them. They've not been given the support and advice around the role of trade unions in enforcing them. And I commend Unite the Union and Better Than Zero and these people who I know have engaged with you directly um, in the way that in which they've been able to highlight these things. But do you think it might be part of the core job of careers advisors to give people information about what a definition of an exploitative job would be and some work around for young people who are not doing modern studies wherever may, where they may get information about trade unions, but actually seeing the trade unions as a place where you would get advice around exercising and enforcing your rights in the workplace? So there's, there's two questions, well there's a lot of questions there, but I think the two fundamental ones were what dialogue do we have with business around the Fair Work Agenda? Um, constant dialogue and we are committed to publishing a Fair Work Action Plan by the end of this year, which I'm charged with the responsibility of. Um, and that will be uh, written through again our approach to, uh, um, uh, to the, the Fair Work Agenda engaging with uh, businesses. We of course have the business pledge in which we've been uh, reviewing again in, in terms of trying to uh, get more businesses to, to take that pledge. Fair work is at the heart of that too, so this is a, a constant part of the agenda that I am taking forward. I mean, it's, it's in my ministerial title. I'm the Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills. So in engaging with business, fair work is uh, an essential part of that equation. In terms of the, <coughs> the role of trade unions and informing young people their rights, I, I would agree with you. I would, I would commend Unite and the Better Than Zero campaign they have led. I um, have been able to engage with the STUC's youth conference uh, over the last two years. I'll continue to do that. And what we'll continue to do is we'll continue to uh, support the Scottish Trade Union Congress and its individual affiliate members through the variety of funding we provide directly to them uh, through the Trade Union Learning Fund, Trade Union Modernisation Fund, some of which I notice we've come into criticism, and indeed the STUC has come into criticism for. That's life. I'll take the criticism um, on, the, on, on the chin. I think it's the right thing to do for us to work uh, in partnership in that fashion. And in terms of uh, how we can ensure young people are aware of their rights, I, I believe in a, a rights-based focus to, to education. Uh, if there's uh, more that can be done, then we'll, we'll certainly be willing to look at that. You, do you do believe there's a direct role for careers advice in informing young people about the role of trade unions in enforcing their rights in the workplace? I believe that we have a partnership approach with trade unions. I believe we provide them with significant resource for the purposes of education. How they might be able to engage with the educational environment is something I'm willing to discuss with them. And also, Minister, these are young people who are not... Um, in trade unions That's and right. asking you whether at the point where they're looking at the uh, world of work there should be something done by careers advice that defines in some way what is a reasonable working environment and their, the role of trade unions and maybe for just because I'm conscious of time the, the final point I want to make would you be willing to do some work around looking at the extent to which business now sees zero hours contracts as the model by which they deliver their business because I certainly see well, that anecdotally that is happening and I wonder if that's something government thinks it could inform or shape. Well, there's two things there. Let me commit to raising the issue with Skilled Development Scotland around careers information guidance. So obviously we discharge, we ask uh, them to take forward careers information guidance work. Um, careers in, careers uh, advisors um, are qualified individuals asked to uh, take forward certain work just now. We'd need to have dialogue with them around what we might expect them to be delivering uh, within the scope of uh, careers advice. In terms of uh, zeros contracts as a business model, uh, the Labour Force survey actually shows that they are reducing uh, in terms of their, uh, as a percentage of um, the uh, prevalence within the labour market in Scotland. Uh, clearly, they do still persist. They, um, they exist to a greater degree in some sectors rather than others. Uh, I think it would be very difficult for us to uh, define uh, whether or not 
specific businesses just view it as a usual part of their business model. Um, but I'm happy for us to, to look at it and consider what we might be able to do. Played here in your conversations with business that you actually ask that question, because then I think you'll find in the hospitality industry, even though they'll be able to assess how many folk they might come through their door in a given week, very few people on the floor in a restaurant will now be anything other than a zero hours contract. Yes, on the flip side, though, I mean, clearly there are um, huge perceptions, historic perceptions about the hospitality sector. One of the things I'm now seeing is that they're increasingly investing uh, far better in training and providing uh, apprenticeship opportunities for young people as well uh, to try and combat that perception. I think we just need to be careful when we're talking about sectors because within sectors you've got individual employers and they'll, they'll have different employment practice. But, you know, I... I I, I need to make clear, when I am speaking to businesses, the fair work agenda across the, the gamut, zeroers contracts, um, the uh, objectives of the fair work conventions framework, uh, the living wage, and all the other areas of activity I'm engaged in are uh, a concerted uh, part of my effort to engage with the business community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for your attendance at committee this morning. Thank you to your officials as well. I'm going to suspend very briefly to allow the witnesses to leave, but can I ask the committee members to remain? As we still have some um, public business. Thank you. Item in public, uh, subordinate legislation. Um, we have received um, information that's subordinate legislation on special restrictions on adoption from Ethiopia, Scotland, Order 2018, SSI 2018 272. I'd just like to ask any members if they have any um, comments to make on subordinate legislation. Can we agree to note that? Thank you very much. And we now move into private session.